Okay, Dan, we we're talking about, uh, you know, scripture and uh, extra biblical sources. And uh, I just got the six volume set of Matthew Henry, as I told you. Uh, but I was also looking at, you know, this catalog that says MacArthur New Testament Commentary, 33 volumes. All right. <laughs> so I just thought I would uh, kind of want to touch on this whole idea of like stick to the Bible or wh where do you come into play here with extra biblical sources? <sighs> I okay myself people said Dan why don't you comprise a uh, a book uh you know of your thoughts and my only concern is uh, that at times people will go to that before they'll actually go to scripture the, the scripture guided me to what's there I only reading what I can see now I you know we want to remember in the law of evidence, even in the world we're surrounded with, uh, evidence is not based on, it, it's it's not to be uh, supported by suppositions or assumptions. Now, if we do assumptions and suppositions, we'll be judged by it because we'll appear in those suppositions and assumptions in title uh, in these courts and uh, um you know, basically adjudication situations under positive law. But we want to be, we want to be, uh, you know, very, very, uh, shall we say, um, wise to realize that when someone's writing like volumes and volumes in book form, that could take away from the reading of God's word. And uh, when we're looking at dictionaries to understand meanings of words, or we're looking at, uh, you know, a concordance that's going to try to bring us to the closest meaning on a word uh, that's used in the Bible, translated from the original tongue, uh, whether it be the Hebrew or the Greek or the Aramaic, and then, you know, placed into our English language, that's a little bit of a different direction uh, than somebody, you know, installing a belief system in you that's based on an interpretation uh, because God's word is meant for everyone uh, to listen and follow. God dictates the rules. And so we've got to be careful because what I find on commentaries and why I a little bit more favored Matthew Henry, and I've quoted out of it quite a bit here and there, I'm not saying anywhere that he's infallible, uh, just as I mentioned John MacArthur in the book Slave, great research, but the man doesn't follow it uh, because it's contradictory, some of the things that he says. Slave has no legal rights, yet he's operating in legal persona. Makes no sense. He's operating in uh, commerce. Uh, he's operating in the man. He's in conflict. But that's for him to bring himself to a reality on. That's not for me. Uh, he's the one who will basically meet his maker and have to explain what he did and what he saw. And just having good intentions is not going to always, you know, uh, make up for misleading uh, someone. So we've tried to stay very, very hard with facts and proper research, doing the Berean uh, due diligence, that we need to research the scriptures. Uh, they just didn't assume that what they were being told was the truth. And we need to do the same thing. So we can see these flaws as we've just talked about and some of these writers uh talk about the rapture and again um that word does not occur in scripture so be very careful when there's ideologies and these are where ideas ideology id imaginations of men come in with these words like the trinity that's an imagination of pagan background that's why the roman catholic church came in with the the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the three are, you know, the same. They'll even use the word person. The three persons, uh, you know, like, does is it really accurate to say God would be wearing a mask? God wears a person. He's using a term out of Latin. Uh, when we do a proper research, we realize that, uh, you know, that's, you know, basically a problem. Uh, and it's been a problem in translations at times because of zeroing in. In fact, I found the other day, Todd, um, that I was looking up where a person or person showed up. And at times you'll find the concordance 
will not have a number beside it. It's because they just added it in. So that's that happens. Okay. Uh, so it's like, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. The word let is not in, uh, is, is not a word that was from where they uh, were translating. In English, they wanted to fill in the gap in the sentence somehow, so they put let. But let was not in there, so you're not going to find uh, in an exact Greek word that was that they could say they took that from to put that in that English sentence. So it would have just said, every soul be subject to the higher powers. It didn't say let Okay, so we got to be careful. So they threw person in in the same way, and it shows up in the concordance where they can't really tell you that it came from where they got the rendering to actually put person there. So we have to be very careful. It's it's scrutinizing. Now, if I can find this, you can find this. So uh, it, it means like anybody who adds to the word of God, you know, is going to have a problem. Uh, Satan tried to add to the word, the God's promise your Christian name, Jesus is the word. So your Christian name represents the word, the promise of God, a warning to the Gentiles and those unbelievers who do not accept. That's what it is. It's a divine warning. Um, but anybody who adds to the word, well, what do they define a surname to be? Name added to one's real name, Collins Gage Dictionary. So they know they're adding something of non-reality fiction into reality. And they're adding to the word. So we got to be careful to not be caught down that. So in the commentaries, when I do quote out of Matthew Henry, I'm very scrutinizing and have read over what I'm sharing to ensure the fact that it's not in conflict with the scripture. Because there are some things at times that Matthew Henry has stated that at the time of when he was living, very heavily affected by Roman Catholicism that moved its way right through the branches of the Church of England and the Protestant Reformation movement, they adopted many, uh, you know, pagan practices from the branch or from the trunk that they broke off from. So we have to realize that at times Matthew Henry had uh, taken in uh, beliefs of child baptism, which were never in the scripture. It was just his opinion. Um, and it's not supported by scripture. So uh, would I read you something about child baptism uh, in favor of what Matthew Henry believes? No, because it's not supported by scripture. So when we read, we got to read with eyes to see, ears to hear, but we have to be uh, having the ability to, uh, to discern. Uh, and therefore, uh, we don't want to be guilty of adding uh, to God's word with our own philosophies. And this is what's happened with the legalistic version of Christianity worldwide and those who operate as legal persons thinking that they're actually the new creature, which they're not. Uh, yeah, they it's funny, Dan. In, in final uh, judgments there, they always say, in the opinion of the court. Everything is opinion, right? Right. And opinions vary, Okay. Mm -hmm. And we have to realize that's just a uh, an assumption, more than not, uh, based on the fact that legal really can't have truth. It requires truth to carry the fiction, to carry the virus, you know, the disease or the diseasement, uh, just within the title that merges together between truth and non-reality and fiction. So when the two merge together, uh, very, very interesting that they call... Um, their source of deciding or making a decision on a judicial matter, uh, they have blind lady justice. Because the blind lead the blind, as Jesus called the scribes, the lawyers at that time, he called them, you know, blind guides. So wouldn't the blind lead the blind and they both would fall into the pit or the ditch? And so this is unfortunately the guilt of legal Christianity. Uh, we, um, you know, we were reading the other day, and I don't know if I have that in front of me. I'll let you see if I carry the book here still. Um, you know, what is our perception of a Christian? You know, and it doesn't really fit uh, early Christianity. So just bear with me one moment. I'll just grab the book, uh, just the encyclopedia. 
Okay, so we have to be careful because, you know, I run into people and, it, and, you know, this is not pointing anybody out in particular. We all have to do self-judgment. We should know what we believe. You know, it's interesting with the Roman Catholic Church, um, they have these garbed white collar criminal priests who may think they, you know, are following God. I'm sure many of them do and even blindly and so afraid uh, to go against what they believe their faith is based on. So they're worried about being excommunicated or removed um, for ever questioning anything. Uh, and it's up to you to do a due diligence. So if you can't ask a question, that's a big concern right off the top. Uh, what, uh, you know, if the facts are in front of you, it should be straightforward. If someone's not giving you the facts, then it's going to be questionable. So what's happened with, uh, you know, we'll just take, for instance, uh, what people believe. A lot of people assume that the Roman Catholic Church is the founding of Christ's teachings. Well, it's not. Uh, it has it's it's of a pagan background. And the Romans and the uh, Constantine, who actually, uh, you know, brought in the mixture of paganism within the beliefs and doctrines and teachings of Christ, um, himself was a profound heathen and did many diabolical things. And so, therefore, uh, when the Roman Catholic Church came into being, we have to realize that that is three and a half centuries later. That is not uh, is not at the founding of the teachings of Christ. So uh, why do people believe that? Because they assume that because they have someone who claims he's literally some infallible, uh, you know, vicar for Christ. And uh, he's without sin. That's what the Roman Catholic Church believes on their popes. You know, anyways, uh, very sad, wearing Babylonian uh, pagan costumes and fish head gods. Uh, and no one sees it because they don't have eyes to see. And then they have their, uh, you know, uh, basically garbed priests, uh, basically taking confessions uh, in little confessional booths. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, the concern there is they're called father. Now, because people are going there for spiritual help, when it's said in scripture, do not call anybody father other than your heavenly father it was speaking of it in the ultimate spiritual sense uh and truthful sense not that we wouldn't have an earthly father that transferred life from our heavenly father uh to have children so that's different so we don't want to take the scripture out of context it was talking about spiritual admonition so no that would be a clear sign of falsehood that the roman catholic church has people who call themselves spiritual fathers. Ridiculous. Then you have the founding fathers of the United States. Ridiculous. And people put great weight in these uh, men, making them into gods. Um, but they're they're nothing more than uh, betitled uh, pagans. Uh, we see the fruit uh, of the tree um, as what it is. So if the tree is of good, uh, it will produce good fruits. If it is of bad or evil, it will produce rotten or evil fruits. And so again, so unfortunately, you gotta have the eyes. You gotta have the eyes to see it when you're reading these commentaries. Be very circumspect. Right? Yes. So I'm not. When I quote out of Matthew Henry's commentary, I'm selectively commenting out of it, but I'm not saying all of Matthew Henry's commentary is the word of God. He makes some very good comments uh, that are structurally sound with God's word. And when he says it, I highlight it. And I realize that he's done a lot of research. In fact, Todd was sharing with me today uh, the background of education of Matthew Henry, his language skills uh, background. Uh, so he, he was a man who was definitely endeavoring to serve God. Uh, he took a modest inheritance that he had had and he used it to preach the word of God. And in fact, uh, in his later days, he was so, uh, you know, basically stretched thin because he was traveling. And you can imagine the amount of work it was traveling around England uh, by horse and buggy just to preach in different areas uh, because he was sought after because uh, a lot of his wisdom 
was reaching the hearts of people because he was sharing a more clear understanding of the Bible. Not that he ever claimed that he had full understanding. He said that he believed that as time, the light would get brighter and there's things that he may not see. So he was humble enough to admit that most of these preachers, they don't tend to do that and they tend to get a following and it turns more into a cult. And I worried about that when I was first doing the uh, Christian Remedy and Law YouTube uh, videos that I didn't want it to be that. I wanted to be on the same ground level as everybody else that I'm just sharing you my experiences and research and I'm doing my best uh, you know, the uttermost uh, that I could uh, to make sure that what I'm saying is accurate uh, from not only from scripture, just within the language we use in the words. So anyways, it's uh, it's a difficult journey. Um, we're not here. We're not here based on judgment of our fellow man. We don't know the ultimate outcome with anyone. That is between themselves and God on judgment day. But what we can do is judge the actions that they may be doing. And if they're wrong, you have every at all unalienable right uh, in truth and grace to speak out and say what you have found. And if someone's preaching the rapture that's not there, the unholy trinity that the Babylonians and many of the other pagan uh, you know, cultures from the past also believed in they had triad gods three-headed gods uh the term godhead is not uh is not an appropriate translation but it was used uh these things are you know basically just concerns the word church shows up in the new testament but it's not the word church is not an appropriate uh translation including uh, charity certainly. and love right yeah i mean they put charity instead of love a love came from agape they removed the word uh, slave out of the Bible in the New Testament to supplant it with the word servant. But in Greek, there is only one word that is for slave, and that's uh, doulos. And they deliberately put uh, servant in there used in an ambiguous manner. It can be both a hireling and or a slave. Uh, and so there's six different Greek words for uh, servant, but not so again, only without, one for slave. Without uncovering the English language and going down to the source language, it's really challenging for an English reader to get to the truth, right? Yes. And we have bad habits because uh, we've uh, we've adopted. It's just like um, in today's society, deplorable. Uh, when I was growing up, you would never, I mean, I was never, ever heard a swear word in uh, or a curse word, so to speak. We know what they are. Um, these are really terrible language. Uh, I just call it toilet uh, language. Uh, it's, uh, you know, locker room uh, language. Uh, you know, it's all through um, the sporting field. I was at many hockey games in my early days, uh, watching the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the idols of the NHL, uh, you know, play. And when I was down there, I heard them through, you know, front row seats, listening to the toilet language they had. Uh, and people call these guys gods, um, but they're just deplorable and they're deplorable in their their lives and what they do. Um, and so it's kind of, you know, unfortunately, we pick up some bad things from bad association. Uh now, you know, we don't use, we shouldn't use those words. They have an energy behind them. Uh, words are powerful. They are spells. And and when we, if you find yourself using these words, these curse words, you're actually cursing yourself uh, because they're, they're vile and they carry vile energy around. So usually it's a, a bad temper that leads to those words. I can get mad and I don't have to use those words. Um, you know, I can have righteous indignation without, well, I don't use the word mad because that sounds like a, insane, but some people would probably think I am, um, uh, at times because of drawing the line on certain things. But, uh, the, the concern factor is that, uh, you are, if you're going to be a Christian, then you better walk it. And if you're walking it, you don't want to bring reproach on his name. And every time we even use these legal last names, we are actually literally cursing the grace of God with something disgraceful. 
um, we are saying that uh, Satan and Caesar is greater than God, um, just by definition of what they claim these legal titles to be. So there is power in these words, uh, and we want to be certain that uh, we're not using those curse words. That's why they call them curse words, because those that use them actually, unfortunately, are bringing a curse upon themselves. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it is it is going to take some time and some thought to get through uh, these moments of trying to get rid of the old uh, creature and 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 really walk with the, the new creature um, that is uh, you know been freed uh, from the penalty of sin and death that would have came through uh, being judged by Adam's sin. Well, Interesting about not, Christians. I guess I'm not going to uh, visit that speed reading course. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, because you'll what happens in speed reading. Two, you'll over, it's just to quickly get through something without really doing a, a true analysis. Um, it's done where there's piles of paperwork and they're just trying to, you know, get through it to see if there's anything that stands out that may cause a problem for them later. But overall, I mean, if you have to speed read something, then you're not going to be reading it properly. And so I don't do that. Um, and I, uh, um, I can feel if I'm on something that I know is just a waste of moments of reading, uh, which is, you know, most of the library publications that are uh, in the public libraries, because they're generally more in fiction than anything dealing with any kind of truth or fact. But one thing about the early Christianity, um, we must uh, realize that it may not be as what you would picture it to be. Um, you know, Christians, uh, you know, basically did not uh, do the things um, that uh, that now mainstream modern Christianity is doing. So, uh, you know, when you go back and uh, you look through and I'm just going to bring about uh, just some points out of an encyclopedia. And there's a few encyclopedias that I have centered out here. And if you just bear with me for a moment. Okay. First century Christians had no temples, built no altars, used no crucifixes, and sponsored no garbed and betitled ecclesiastics. Early Christians celebrated no state holidays and refused all military service. Well, that would pretty much wipe out all Christianity today. Okay. They've been involved in almost every war and every conflict. They'll kill their fellow man whether or fellow woman, um, whether they're of any of the divisions of legal Christianity, pseudo-Christianity. Uh, it says, a careful review of all information available goes to show that until the time of Marcus Aurelius, who ruled 161 to 180 AD, no Christian became a soldier and no soldier after becoming a Christian remained in military service. And what I read out of there is the rise uh, of Christianity by E. Barnes, 1947, page 333. So okay. if you, you got to do a due diligence. That's the key. So yeah. what was an early Christian? Well, you know, one of the interesting things, and I'm... Uh, and we'll probably break this into the next session. Okay, I just is, want to touch on what you re read there for a second here, that there was no emblems for someone to outwardly display through garb or crosses or anything like that, that they were Christians. That's right. And it wasn't until the actual fourth century that the use of what they would say is the lowercase cross as the symbol because it's not in theological um, research, historians that deal with Bible research do not favor the belief that Jesus was executed on a lower case T. They have more of a rendering that it was most likely more so a capital T, even though they may have placed a plaque at the top. But the standard lower case, because it has a lot to do with the background of symbols that the pagans would have more likely um, accepted when they got into adopting 
paganism with Christianity. Um, the Egyptians, of course, had their phallic symbol of a cross with a bulb, which was a fertility symbol. Well, you so know that, you know that even in the I think the Greek words are built into the symbol of the fish. I think they made that as a kind of a sign in the sand that they were kind of you know secretly you know yes. not overtly Christians. Um, any comment about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I again, we're looking at assumptions, kind of thing, you know. Why were they assuming this or why were they, you know, endeavoring to bring this into a belief system? And, and that's where you need to go to the root of it. If you can't get to the root of it, maybe it's safer not to go near it. Because the odds are it may not have any foundation in truth. Um, God would allow truth to make its way through. And therefore, he wouldn't leave it that it would be ambiguous and unclear. So a lot of these traditions that we see, especially what is seen in mainstream Christianity is concerning. Where do they get these? Where did the white collar come from? Where did these black garbs that these priests wear come from? Uh, why do the magistrates dress in such a manner? Why, is, why are these costumes involved? What is it about? What is it? You know, why would they be doing that? And, and so these are the concerns. And if you don't go and look at the origin, you won't see what's going on. Uh, and, and therefore, there was no indication that any part of early Christianity had any followers wearing crosses. So if you're wearing a cross and I'm offending you right now, it's only because you're offended because you're doing it and you want to defend it, but you have no reason to defend it other than you think that's the symbol to believe that you want to use the symbol of Christ being executed by the device that he was executed on um, as being something that's going to bring salvation to you. Now, if your father or a loved one was shot with a gun, would you make a replica of the gun and wear it around your neck? We don't ask these questions because mainstream legal Christianity um, has been so paganized and legalized uh, through the Roman civil system and it's Babylonian background that we don't, uh, uh, we, we've been scarred uh, not to see. So we have cataracts over our eyes of truthful vision. And so, you know, and if people say, well, I'm just going to wear it. And I've heard people say that. And then we get into things like rosary beads and things like that. And, and yes, I guess if that's all I've been trained to believe in, and I've never questioned it, well, that's the concern. And, and so I came to a questioning um, regarding many things that are considered okay in what we call Christianity today. And that's why it's so divided, because they're not following the Bible. These are legal divisions of Christianity. They're not spiritual. There is only God's word. There is one God, his Son, and the Holy Spirit, the power of God. Uh, there is the word of God, and are we reading it? And were we reading it? Uh, with eyes to see and ears to hear. And this is where I don't know what people's background are when I'm speaking to them. I may even have people that are on Zooms at times that literally think that because they were told something through whoever told them about Christ and brought them into Christianity, you know, it's the it's it's reality and they have a hard time shaking it off. So no, the rapture, the word is not in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. But the origin of where these come from, to an extent, leads to a lot of pagan origin. And so how many Christians are celebrating uh, Christmas? It's a completely pagan holiday. has nothing to do with other than a mockery, a uh, commercial uh, usage of Christ, and then bringing it into the pagan, uh, you know, birth date uh, that is used by sun worshipers uh, and also those that would know that that would lead to the origin of Nimrod and his birth date. So anyways, it's and how many Christians celebrate birthdays? Well, and then they put candles on a cake and then blow out the flame, right? Well, what was that telling you? It's death. It's not bringing in the light. The light's on there only for a moment and then make your wish and blow out the light. Okay. And you're you right in the darkness of the dead. 
A lot of people with their heads swimming off the off of this fireside. So let's call it let's call it for now, and uh, we'll get on another one. Thank you, Dad. Okay. All right.